Hi, my name is Matt Bondurant. I'm the author of The Wettest County in the World, which the film Lawless is based on, and you're watching Pretentious Film Majors. We're here with Matt Bondurant, writer of the novel The Wettest County in the World, which is the inspiration for the new movie Lawless, but it's also based on his grandfather and his grandfather's brother. Uh, the book is based on a true story, they say, and then it's also adapted once again for Lawless. W would you mind explaining a little bit about where the truth ends and where the fiction begins and maybe telling us the background of the infamous Bondurant brothers? Right. Well, there's a couple pieces of, um, uh, of historical fact but that, that sort of formed the foundation for the, for the novel. Um, we, you know, we, we know, for example, that my, my grandfather, uh, Jack, and his two brothers were involved in the moonshine trade. We also know that uh, my, my granduncle Forrest got his throat cut by some, some men um, one night outside of this restaurant slash sort of uh, moonshine, moonshine way station that he used to run. Um, and, there's, and, th and then there's the, the shootout at Maggie Creek Bridge in December 1930 where my, my grandfather and his brother were shot by Sheriff's Deputy Charlie Rakes. A few other things too. Um, most everything out throughout, it, it thro uh, in between there, is is created essentially conjecture. You know, it, it, you can kind of view it as a the way I viewed it was sort of as a constellation. You know, I have a few events that I tied together with the dramatic narrative, and so one of the challenges was to create plausible scenarios that would lead to such a thing. You know, how would it get to this point? Um, so you know, there, there, and then the, of course the film kind of, kind of takes those those basic elements and you know amplifies them to some degree. Um, you know, there's a lot more gunplay <laughs> at the uh, at the shootout than there was in the real story. You know, than in my story, and then certainly in the real story. So, um, you know, it, it's it's a it's a it's a mix of, of of you know dealing with the historical record as best we have. And it's not as if I was taking a whole bunch of uh, historical information and leaving it out. There was very little to go on. There's no letters. There's no memoirs. There's no barely any pictures. Really, nobody can account for the day-to-day -day goings on, uh, you know, in 1930 in, in, in Franklin County, especially for an 18-year-old kid. So, all of that is, you know, obviously, completely fabricated. You know. So, how much research did you then have to do in order to uh, properly tell the story, or was a lot of that research just uh, negated by the parts that you filled in with fiction? Well, uh, there's a fair amount of research, but the research was mostly was about. Um, Things like the chemistry behind uh, moonshine, uh, you know, a, a distillation process. You know, what, what was life like? Uh, sort of setting up the culture and the world of the story. What was life life like in Franklin County in 1930? Uh, what is what did an 18-year-old guy wear or drive or want or you know, um, those kinds of those kinds of cultural historical details, which was the bulk of the research. Um, because the incidents, you know, were just few, and there was a few newspaper articles, there's some court transcripts, grand jury testimony that sort of talks about some of the incidents. There's a few lines that my grandfather and his brother say that I was able to use, but um, a minimal amount of information. I'm asked sometimes, you know, why didn't you think about this as a nonfiction project? And the, the short answer is just because it's, there was not enough information. I would have had to fill in. The blanks anyway, um, and you know, and as a novelist, as a fiction writer, that's my natural urge anyway, and it's, that's my way I prefer to do it. So it was a lot of fun to like reimagine the life, the lives of these men, and particularly my grandfather, who I knew as an old man when I was very young, and so to imagine him as 18 years old, 20 years old, getting into these situations was was a lot of fun. And uh, there's always going to be changes when you adapt something from a novel to a film. Are there any major differences you notice, and are they for better or worse? I think the most significant changes have to do with the characters of uh, Charlie Riggs and uh, Maggie. Uh, in, the, in the movie, they're both from Chicago, which is uh, not the case in the book um, and not the case in historical fact. Um, I, you know, the, the filmmakers did that to, to, especially with Charlie Riggs, you know, to make him a more clear-cut villain, to accentuate the difference uh, of, you know, he's, he's an outsider coming in, and, and that makes him, uh, um, just sets him up as a, as a villain uh, quicker, uh, which is what you have to do in film. Um, in the novel, there, it's it's a more complicated picture with Charlie Rakes, and uh, and I tried to create um, you know a reason, a scenario why he would come to be um, to have this real strong hatred for for my grandfather and his brothers, and and, and, and try to try to kill them in, in 1930. Um, and then the the character of Maggie Jessica Chastain, uh, you know, also they have her coming from Chicago, and just kind of the, you know, and I, I think that it works to pretty good effect because she. Um, 
you know, she's, she's this real sort of splash of color in the screen, you know, when she comes in, and, and the way that she's different from the brothers, and it makes the relationship between her and Forrest a bit more, you know, seemingly incongruous, which makes it all the more kind of romantic and interesting that, you know, so I, I understand the instincts uh, behind the filmmakers to go for it. So it's, you know, I, I wouldn't say that, that any of them are for better or for worse, really. It's a different medium, and the medium has certain requirements. You can't do the kind of, the way the character building is done in, um, in a novel. So they have to make adjustments, they have to amplify things, exaggerate things, and, and chop things down. And I think they did that, and for the most part, uh, you know, really all the, you know, the choices they made, I think, uh, make, make sense to me. So were you able to get involved with production at all? I don't have any direct contractual, um, you know, responsibility in the film at all. You know, they they didn't have to consult me, um, but they they did very generously keep me involved. I had a lot of conversations with John Hillcoat and um, various actors uh, on the phone, email. Um, they invited my father and I down to the set for a couple of days, so we were able, to, you know, to hang out there and watch filming and meet meet some of the principal actors and Tom Hardy and Jessica Chastain and stuff, which was really cool. Um, they showed me the scripts as they were going through its various iterations, what Nick Cave was doing. Um, you know, that, so that, that they kept me involved, uh, and I think just, you know, in, in part because they, 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 as they expressed to me, that they, they wanted to stay true to the spirit of the book as much as possible and the spirit of the story and the characters, and they respected the book and they wanted to let me know that, and uh, which I, of course, greatly appreciate. So I'm, I'm very fortunate in that regard. A lot of, a lot of writers don't get, uh, you know, any kind of interaction. You know, they didn't have to, and they, and they did include me quite a bit. Uh, so, considering all these big stars, and were you particularly excited when anybody got involved, or did you think, "Wow, there's Tom Hardy is, you know, a Bondurant is perfect." Was there anybody you got really excited that was on the production? Well, yeah, I mean, it was it was weird, but when it, when it first, um, you know, Shia LaBeouf was attached to it for a long time, um, so I got, I kind of got used to thinking about him. It's funny when Tom Hardy jumped on, uh, I I. I think I'd heard his name, but I, I don't think I'd seen any. Oh, well, I'd seen, um, what's the Guy Ritchie film that he was in? Uh, Rock and Roll? Rock and Roll, right. Yeah. I'd seen that, but I didn't know that was him, per se. And then I saw Bronson. Have you guys seen Bronson? Yeah, he's uh, my God. crazy. So I watched that, and I was like, okay, this guy's the real deal. And everybody was telling me, like, oh, this guy's going to be the next big thing. And then he's got the Batman thing and all this. And so I was like, okay, this is really cool. I think when Jessica Chastain came on, I was like, okay, well, that's somebody that I clearly know, and she's blown up. Of course, you know, Gary Oldman, Guy Pearce, um, you know, are two just classic, great, uh, you know, uh, and Gary Oldman in particular. I, I, both those guys are actually two of my favorite actors, really. I mean, I, I really, enjoy, you know, I think about, I think about Guy Pearce and Priscilla Queen of the Desert, for example. You know, just incredible. And and uh, Gary Oldman, I think about Immortal Beloved. You know, that Beethoven film, which I, I love, and I think he's brilliant in it. So. Um, I, you know, I, yeah, well, they all kind of jumped, they all kind of came in close together. Like, it was, there was like a snowball effect, you know, it was, for a long time it was just Shia, and various other actors were kind of attached, and they weren't attached, and things were kind of going back and forth, and, you know, and every, they, I would just get this information occasionally from, from L.A., they would tell me about something, I'm like, okay, well, but I didn't, you know, it felt very distant for me. But then when, um, when Tom Hardy committed, it sort of, everybody was like, okay, let's jump on board this thing now. And I think a lot of it had to do with, with Hillcoat. Um, people wanted to work with Hillcoat. He's an upcoming director that just did The Road. A lot of people like that. I love The Road. Um, Proposition, of course, is a great film, too. And uh, I think a lot of people wanted to work with him. And, a lot, and they were willing to do it for, for cheap. I mean, this was a lower budget film. You know, all these actors, many of them who command major salaries, did it for drastically less money. So, At what point did uh, Hillcoat actually get attached? And well, what did that do for the very movie? early? You know, he was. I, I think him and I think him and Shia were essentially um, very, very early. I think he read he read the book, and um, I, I'm a little cloudy in how these things work. You guys probably know more than me, but like, you know, it seemed to me that he, what he you know they read the book and then he talked to Columbia Pictures and was like, you know, you should buy this and then we'll do it, you know, or something like that. And then they bought it and he because he was he was attached from the get go basically. And, and I guess when they say attached, that doesn't mean he's like committed contractually. He's just, it's something he's interested in doing. And him and Shia were, were, were the whole time. Um, there were various other actors and actresses. You know, uh, Ryan Gosling at one point was, was, was attached uh, to play Forrest and uh, Scarlett Johansson. And it was like all kinds of various people, um, you know, all of which were exciting and interesting. It was like, great. Um, but this current, this current crew I, I really like because there's uh, people like, like Gary Oldman and stuff that, that are just... Um, uh, you know, seasoned, 
you know, tried and true great actors that, and, and people that pick good projects, you know. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with the, the cast, that's for sure. How do you think your grandfather and his brothers would have felt about their portrayal in the film? That's hard to say. I think my grandfather uh, would, would, I think he would like it. I don't, you know, I don't know how he'd feel about Shia LaBeouf in particular. I mean, I think Shia does a great job um, with, you know, with the, with the role. It's a, it's a big role and it's, he has to cover a lot of ground emotionally and, he, you know, and he, I think he shows pretty good range in it. Um, I thought he played the earnestness and sort of ambition of, uh, of my grandfather uh, really well um, and also with a little bit of uh, the humor to him. I thought he was good. Um, you know, my grandfather was somebody that liked to be noticed and to be known. He was kind of a, a, a well-respected figure in town. He wasn't an outgoing particularly. He wasn't flashy per se. But the only pictures that exist from, of him from that time, there's really only two. And both of them, he's dressed out in his like best clothes with a cigar perched on top of his car, you know. Uh, you know, he, he, he fashioned himself a, a, not necessarily a gangster, but a you know, a, a man of, of certain means and somebody that's perhaps a little bit dangerous. That was, that was part of the image he was projecting. I think that uh, I think that he would be he would be pretty pleased by this. You know, even even if he didn't sort of express it, I think he would, he would like it. All right, I'll ask one last question. What's it like sharing the last name with a couple on-screen badasses? It's it's pretty badass. I mean, it's awesome. It, um, yeah, I mean, I didn't I didn't think about that until when I first saw the trailer, and they say the last name like six times and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, this is you know, this is awesome. Um, it's very cool. I mean, I, I, you know, how can you not like that? It's the kind of thing that uh, that you kind of dream about as a little kid and and growing up that your family has some kind of vital or important history that people find interesting or that that sort of deepens you know your your understanding of your family in some way and. Um, uh, yeah, I'm certainly proud of the fact, you know, I mean, I hope it doesn't cause people to start taking punches at, you know, punching me in the street just for no reason or um, seeing if they can kill me off, you know, because supposedly we're invincible. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's great. <laughs> it's really cool. Yeah, you know, and if somebody wants to try to punch me in the street, they can go for that too if they want. <laughs>